So, uh, welcome to a conversation with the curator, and it is exactly what it sounds like. Okay, so tonight we're going to hear a conversation uh, between the artist, Leslie Barlow, uh, the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery Director, Nicole Watson, and Women's Art Institute co-instructor, Anna Garski. Uh, about Leslie's terrific new paintings, which are all around us. I'm Patricia Olson. I'm associate professor here at the Department of Art and Art History and director of the Women's Art Institute. And the Institute is very pleased to co-sponsor this event tonight with the gallery. But before I get into the kind of preliminaries of this, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the huge contribution of Linda Nochlin to women's art history. <laughs> Professor Nochlin passed away this past week at the age of 86 uh, after a rich and influential scholarly life. She is best known for her essay, and I'm not going to call it a seminal essay, uh, <laughs> Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, first published in Art News in 1971. I highly recommend it to you if you haven't already read it, and so in that essay, she makes several arguments that feminist art historians have gone on to investigate in, in depth. And in writing this essay, she practically invented feminist art history. Um, in case you're wondering, the answer to uh, why have there been no great women artists uh, is that she concludes that's the wrong question. She says, uh, the fault lies not in our stars, our hormones, our menstrual cycles, or empty internal spaces, but in our institutions and our education. So here's a salute to Lynn Nochlin, contemporary women's art would not be the same without her. Okay, so now a few words about the Women's Art Institute, and then I'm going to introduce Anna and then uh, Nicole will introduce Leslie. So the heart of the Women's Art Institute is a four-week summer studio course. It's for advanced women artists every June. Every session is unique, and it grows out of the questions that the artists themselves bring to working in the studio, connecting with content, and with history. It's a community that both challenges and nurtures artistic vision. Over the 18 years that we've been offering this course, we've welcomed fiber artists, painters, printmakers, sculptors, ceramicists, photographers, collages, video installation, performance artists, and every combination uh, imaginable. Students have ranged in age from 19 to 78, and they come from all over, but mainly in the Twin Cities uh, area. Participants in the Institute work closely with the teachers, who are Anna and myself, and each student presents a major portfolio of work at the conclusion of the course. We also hear from a dozen local artists and art historians, engendering context and a sense of community. Now, brochures for the upcoming Summer Studio Intensive, which is June 4th to uh, 28th, 2018. Uh, this is just a little flyer, and there's some out there that you can grab uh, on your way out if you're interested, but the big brochure is gonna be available in January. And if you're interested or know somebody who might benefit, uh, please leave your email at the sign-in sheet in there, and we will be sure you get some information about that. We have a website, too. <laughs> so, sankate.edu slash WAI. Very, very good. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-conspirator <laughs> at the Institute, Anna Garski. Anna is a magna cum laude uh, graduate of St. Kate. She majored, majored in both studio art and women's studies. And after she finished here, she went on to the San Francisco Art Institute, where she earned both an MFA and an MA degree in history and theory of contemporary art. Last fall for the Institute, Anna conceived and organized a listening experience and a series of study groups around the book Art on My Mind by the black feminist writer Bill Hooks. Anna is a painter who also works in video installation and performance art, and she will be teaching a figure drawing course for us here in January. Yes. Yes. I'm so excited. <laughs> so now I'll turn the program over to Nicole Watson. Thank you. 
So good evening. Great to have so many of you here tonight. Welcome to the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery. Um, as Pat mentioned, I'm Nicole Watson. I'm the director and the curator here. Um, and before we begin, I'm going to do two things. I just want to tell you a little bit about the format. So we're just we're going to have a conversation. Anna and I have come to develop this of questions. Um, for Leslie, and so we're going to have a little question and answer session, um, and we'll do that for about 40 minutes. And then there will be time at the end for you um, to ask Leslie some questions too, so make sure you think of some things along the way. Um, and then also I have the great honor of introducing our guest of honor and our artist uh, who's here tonight, Leslie Barlow. Uh, Leslie is a practicing artist living and working in Minneapolis. Primarily an oil painter, her current work employs the figure and narrative elements to explore social issues such as race, representation, multiculturalism, and otherness. She investigates these themes through a lens of personal experience, often creating works depicting family, friends, and the people in her community. Her paintings reflect the subtle and not so subtle complexities of identity and individualism. Leslie received her BFA in 2011 from the University of Wisconsin Stout and her MFA in 2016 from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. In 2016, she received a Minnesota State Arts Board Artist Initiative grant, and that same year, she was the artist in residence at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. Her work has been included in solo and group exhibitions throughout the Twin Cities most recently at the Minnesota Museum of American Art um, in St. Paul, and then also at Public Functionary in Minneapolis. In addition to her studio practice, Barlow um, currently teaches, uh, or currently works as an assistant instructor at Juxtaposition Arts, and she teaches drawing at the University of Minnesota. So welcome, Leslie. <laughs> Off, Leslie, oh. and just get us started here. So, yeah, So, I think that maybe it would be great if you could just tell us um, a little bit about yourself and sort of why you embarked on this series of work. Yeah, it's um, it's a really, really long story. But <laughs> good thing we're at an artist talk. Yeah, so we, got we got time. We got time. Um, so yeah, my name is Leslie. Uh, my, uh, I grew up in South Minneapolis, so I'm a Twin Cities native. Um, I went through the Minneapolis public school system. Like she said, I went to Stout uh, for my undergrad, and then I went to MCAT for my master's. Um, I am brown. I don't know if you guys noticed that. That's, <laughs> that's a thing. Uh, I don't typically introduce myself in that way, but um, for the context of this work and like what I'm interested in as far as like race and identity, um, in this work, I think that's important to acknowledge that um, my parents have an interracial marriage, and that is kind of the foundation for a lot of the work that I create, but it hasn't always been that way. Um, so my work kind of took a shift uh, in 2013, and there were a couple of different events that, that started that are kind of like that catalyst um, to have my work uh, start talking about race and identity. But before that, uh, my work actually... Um, just was really trying to focus on just people and um, trying to talk about identity, but I was always kind of dancing around the issue of race. Um, so where that is grounded in is actually to go all the way back to me being um, a kid. Uh, I grew up in a very multicultural community. Um, I grew up, like I said, on the south side of Minneapolis. Um, my parents made it actually... Uh, they worked really hard to make sure that I was surrounded by all different uh, ethnicities, like we went to a multicultural church, for example, um, where different languages were spoken. And, and there were all of these different efforts to make sure that, um, that me and my brothers grew up in a, in a space that felt like reflective of our, our family dynamics, right? But I think where the tension kind of first started for me as a kid um, really happened in middle school. Uh, and um, Essentially what happened was, you know, I'm growing up in this community and like my school bus is like full of all like brown and black kids and, and this was like the life that I lived, right? But then when I got to school, um, I was in these accelerated classes and all my classes were white kids. And so 
there was automatically like this tension that started to happen for me um, identity wise as far as like what I thought like I you know was growing up in and like what I thought was me and then like but then being the only uh, brown person in my classes at school and so what ended up happening um, for me there was that I uh, essentially wanted to not necessarily blend in but just kind of quiet you know my identity um, and there were other reasons for that as well um, I think Part of that is due to, you know, as a kid, you're trying to figure out, like, who you are, right? There's a lot of uh, uh, discovery. Uh, people want you to kind of say exactly what you are, pick sides. Um, and as a kid, that was really hard for me because I grew up in such a multi-ethnic community that I didn't really know that was a thing. Um, also, at the time, uh, let's see, I grew up in the, this would have been, like, the early, or no, like, the late 90s, early 2000s. This was a time when, like, when you had to fill out uh, questionnaires, like, you know, uh, about your race, like, for, like, census. a test. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I was too young to, like, fill out the census, <laughs> but, um, but, like, for, like, a uh, standardized test, for example, like, I think they'll start when you're, like, 10 or something. Mm -hmm. um, this was a time when you had to check one box. Uh, we didn't really have language at this time to, to acknowledge the complexities of um, racial identities. Um, so, I was confronted like by papers, you know, like about like my identity. I was confronted by it just in like the social uh, structures of my school, and then also on top of that, um, at the time, like there weren't any books like about mixed race kids. Like there weren't. I mean, that that I was aware of. Um, there wasn't really anything acknowledging my existence as something that was normal. So, understanding all of that, like the context of how I grew up, the older I got. Like the the uh, the more I suppress the the wanting to like express my um, mixed race identity, uh, so I just kind of didn't want to talk about it. Um, not that I wasn't comfortable talking about race, but I didn't want to ever talk about it as acknowledging my own self in that conversation. Um, and then going into college, uh, I always liked art, but I actually didn't uh, want. Or I went to college thinking I might want to go into art, but I had this notion like most people do that like probably gonna be poor if you're an artist <laughs> and like uh, both my parents are, are public school teachers so um, we lived a, a modest life you know like it's not like we were super rich or anything but um, we had enough and I just knew that like I at least wanted to be at that level you know like, I just, like, didn't want to like struggle or something that um, so yeah so I went to college I was like maybe I'll go into design maybe I'll go into something art related um, but once I got into school uh, my teachers really encouraged me to um, go into studio art uh, and so I think I declared myself a studio art major like my sophomore year of school uh, but again like in school I had this kind of like this little thing kind of growing inside me I was like oh, I should shouldn't I be able to talk about my identity what is my identity like it you know for 18 years I had kind of suppressed this thing but I didn't I still didn't feel comfortable talking about it and that was compounded by the fact that I went to University of Wisconsin South, um, <laughs> which is in Menominee, Wisconsin, uh, not a very diverse place, um, and I was often the only person of color in the in you know in those classrooms, um, and so that really was difficult um, being in a rural area and also being a person of color out there and so like the last thing I wanted to do was like make paintings about my blackness you know like that's not only was that like the expectation um, but it was gonna already draw attention um, or it was going to draw more attention to my identity when I was already very hyper visible in that space um, so I kind of uh, pushed back against that all through all through college and I graduated in 2011 um, with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in painting. I was making large paintings of people. Um, there were some black and brown people in them, but I was like, it's not about race. It's not about race, I swear it's not about race. Um, and so, yeah, and so I was like doing these things, and then um, after, after college, once I moved back to Minneapolis, that's when I started actually being like, okay, what's going on here? Like, I'm 21 why can't I talk about my own identity? Like, I've lived 21 years and I'm still not comfortable talking about my own identity. Um, and what was the real catalyst for, for my work having this shift was uh, a Cheerios commercial. Well, there's a couple things, actually. The Cheerios commercial, which I'll get into, was kind of like what really wanted made me uh, create visual, you know, the visual work. But um, I started reading a couple... Uh, 
authors. Um, Maria P. P. Root is, is one woman who I started reading the work by. Um, I also uh, started looking at the artwork of Adrienne Piper and then like reading what she was writing and this was like back in like the 80s um, but she was like uh, really influential um, just talking about like mixed race identity um, back in that time in her work and she's like a very conceptual artist you know um, I think she might have a few paintings but like mostly installation art and some drawings yeah and some drawings yeah. yeah yeah but then like other totally primarily other stuff. really heavily steeped in philosophy yes yeah even yes. on her website yeah. she's like it's like space and time and then mm -hmm. it like it says like philosopher and all this other stuff um, uh, and then artist you know <laughs> um, so yeah she's super cool so I was um, getting into her work and uh, and then the, this, well, and also politically, there was other things happening around this time. This was the time that uh, Trayvon Martin got got shot. There was like, uh, there was a lot of stuff happening around 2012, 2013. Um, so I'm like getting more and more aware of what's going on, just like politically, um, reading, you know, uh, people that I should have been looking at in college, <laughs> but my teachers never told me about any of these people. Um, Maybe because they didn't know about them. Maybe because they didn't want to go there. I have no idea. But um, I had to seek these things out on my own. I wasn't really shown any artists of color when I was in college. Like these are things I had to do on my own. And this wasn't school. that long ago. Right. No, this was in 2011. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is yeah. in 2011. So. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I said, yeah. So by 2013, I'm like on this like path of discovery, and then this Cheerios commercial comes out. Um, by General Mills, which I've, re I've referenced in my artist statement, but um, it's not that the commercial itself was like the most important part. The commercial was very plain. It was just about breakfast and like um, I don't know who has seen the commercial. Do you guys love a commercial? Yeah. That was, most people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so I'll describe it. Um, what happens in the commercial is that this little girl uh, who uh, is biracial, she goes up to her mom who is white and uh, asks her mom, are Cheerios heart healthy? And then her mom like looks at the box and she's like, oh yeah, it looks like they are heart healthy. And then the little girl is like, gets this devious smile on her face. And she uh, runs out of the room and you're like, what is she gonna do? And then she goes and like the camera pans over to her dad who's napping on the couch with a bunch of Cheerios like on his chest and he wakes up from his nap and they all spill on the ground. <laughs> Um, and then he's like, honey, you know, and then it's like, ha ha, that's the end of the commercial. <laughs> so, um, it's really just about, yeah, this little girl who's like, wants her dad's heart to be healthy. Um, on her dad was black, I don't know if I said that, but yeah, so, um, I saw this commercial for the first time on YouTube, I don't remember how I found it, but I was so excited because the commercial, uh, represented a family that looked exactly like mine, and the commercial was not about race. That was like key, you know, because um, any representation up until this point uh, had had or of people of interracial uh, relationships or families like that was the subject of the representation of them. You know, like there was like it's like tension, you know, in a, in a TV show like that was like the the, um, the idea, and in this commercial that wasn't the case. It was just about Cheerios, um, so that was really exciting for me to see. Um, and then I scrolled through the YouTube comments <laughs> because I was curious and um, yeah, that was not so good. Um, the I, I mean, I'm sure there were really good comments, but you know how like the ones that are most popular like have the most controversy, like get put, put up to the top because they get the most feedback and dislikes and likes or whatever. Um, and those were all horrible comments, you know, mm -hmm. ranging from like this little girl's ugly, um, and she was like four or five in the commercial, like she was little. and then. Um, also talking about, um, you know, oh, that's not a realistic depiction of a black father. Um, and things that I had heard as a youth myself, so now I'm like going through this like, tra like traumatic experience again. Like, like you know, it's kind of like drudging up all these things from my own past that like I had personally experienced that I'm now like reading in these comments. I'm like, wait a second, like that happened to me 20 years ago and like this is still happening and these aren't just trolls. and. Um, General Mills actually ended up uh, disabling the comments first, and then they removed the commercial from YouTube altogether. Um, I think the commercial's back on there now, but it wasn't for a little while. So yeah, that's that's the commercial. Uh, so a couple things went through my mind at that point, and don't worry, we're getting to this work. <laughs> I told you it's a long story. I told you. Um, so 
what happened with that commercial is that I, I had kind of like two questions. One was why, why don't we see representations like this more often? And two, what caused these people who made these comments to feel this way? Not just like racism in general, but like what, what really specifically um, is making them feel some sort of way about this imagery? And I think, you know, my conclusion was, was partially that you just don't see it. You know, like it's not normalized. And like to them, like this doesn't represent a normal family. Although for me, that is totally a normal family. And like I know lots of other families that are like that, right? It's just that we don't see it visually represented. So there's this false, um, this false idea that that's not normal. So um, at this point, uh, I decided that's where I wanted my work to go. I also separately was thinking about applying to grad school at the time. And so um, I kind of put together this proposal of like, I actually wanted to start doing this research in grad school. Like, like shift my work, mm -hmm. dig deep into like my personal, you know, shit, and then like, <laughs> and like make work about it all in grad school. And That's I was perfect. like, I know, I was yeah, like, that yeah. sounds like a great place to do that. Um, I mean, it was kind of, but uh, so yeah, so that's what I applied to grad school for, and then I got at, I got into the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in 2014, and over the next two years, I was making work about these ideas, and um, also at the same time, in 2014, I joined a dialogues group called Mixed Race Dialogues. I had met a couple people um, at a conference in 2013 that want, you know, we had connected over issues of like identity and race because we both kind of like, or we all kind of made work surrounding it and, and we just talked about like, maybe we should all get together and talk about this because they also both identified as mixed race. And so I was like, yeah, let's get together and like just talk about it. And like it started really small and then it grew and grew and then like it became this monthly thing where like 15 to 20 people at a time were just like getting together to drudge up stuff about their identity like and like just kind of try to unpack it um in a in a group setting it was really uh healing and um i don't know cathartic it was it was awesome so it was like going through that while i was also making the work so i had that kind of community support um on my like personal identity journey and i'm making this work um and then uh in 2015 uh the minnesota state arts board grant had you know like their open call and I decided that, um, so you apply in that year, but then it's supposed to, or sorry, you apply for, yeah, in, in 2015, and the grant years from 2016 to 2017. Yes. And I mm -hmm. knew that 2017 was going to be the 50th anniversary of the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case. Um, that Supreme Court case, I don't know how I knew about it, I just always did. I think maybe my parents told me about it when I was young, but I always knew about the lovings. It was like, I mean... Can we remind everybody yeah. in the audience what the <laughs> oh, yeah. significance yeah. of that? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, um, Loving versus Virginia, uh, the, the court case basically uh, shot down um, the last, what was like 17 or 18 states that had anti-miscegenation laws. It, it ruled them um, uh, unconstitutional. So, um, the lovings, Mildred and Richard Loving, very adorable last name, but that was their real last name. Um, they, uh, it was, I think in the late 50s, they uh, were from Virginia, they moved to, or they went to Washington, D.C. to get married because you couldn't legally in their home state of Virginia. Then they moved back because that's where their family was, their livelihood, their friends, everything. That's where they worked, where um, Richard worked. Um, and so uh, that's where they wanted to raise their family, and then the police, uh, busted down their door in the middle of the night and arrested them for sleeping together mm -hmm. um, and as you know husband and wife and they went to jail and then they were threatened with prison um, sentences and, unless they moved out of the state so they did move out of the state eventually but then they would keep coming back because I mean like that's where their family is and they're raising kids and who wants to raise kids alone without the support of their family mm -hmm. um, so yeah so they uh, would get uh, continually arrested or caught, you know, and then, so eventually it went to the ACLU, the ACLU took their case, um, all the way to the Supreme Court, and then, there we go, mm -hmm. then the laws got smashed. So you were inspired to make a body of work that 
coincided with the 50th anniversary. Right, exactly. Days. Yeah, because I mean, it, up, you know, leading up to this point, I'm like, you know, it's snowballing. Like, all my work mm -hmm. is on talking about representation and race, mixed race identity, multiculturalism. Like, it's all happening. And then I'm like, there, this is like, totally makes sense to have a body of work that coincides with the anniversary, mm -hmm. like, to really, like, solidify, mm -hmm. you know, this, like, representation idea, you know, and mm -hmm. so um, that's what I applied for the grant, um, and then I got the grant, which was fantastic, it was, like, the biggest grant I've ever gotten, um, and thank you, Minnesota State Arts Board, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, uh, yeah, 2016, I spent the whole year ideating uh, for this body of work, creating the body of work, and then I first exhibited it at Public Functionary in February uh, 2017, so this year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the, the long story of like how <laughs> I got to this body of work, and really like the goal was not only to highlight the Supreme Court case, but to also um, just acknowledge the lack of representation of diverse family dynamics. Mm -hmm. 50 and years later, right? Yeah, 50 right. Yes. years later, right? Like, that, that was the whole point, is, like, trying to, to, you know, acknowledge that this is not that far away. Like, it was only 50 years ago, and people always wonder, like, well, why are there still, you know, why are we still have racial tensions in this country? I don't understand. Like, like, it's, like it's so far away, but, like it's, yeah. like, it's so recent. I mean, obviously, well, now that Trump's elected, we all, you know, we're just being clear. But, like, I'm just saying, like, before, before even that, like, people were just like, oh, I thought we had supposed racial. Um, and that's just not the case. And so, um, yeah, I was trying to acknowledge that, also celebrate the court case, um, and celebrate uh, these beautiful families. So, yeah. Who are the people in, in your portraits? Um, they are all families from the Twin Cities area. I wanted it to also be a reflection of this community. This is where I grew up. Um, I wasn't trying to um, trying to explain families' lived experiences. Not not that I know everything about Twin Cities, but like you know, from some other place. Like I really wanted to ground to ground the work in this um, community. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people I know. Um, some of the people are people I grew up with, uh, friends. On the very back wall there, those are my uh, grandmothers. Aww. So I do know them very well. Um, and that painting is such a show. Oh, so nice. nice. oh, I love that love piece that. a lot. Um, and then others, other families. I because this isn't this isn't all the work. There's actually five other paintings in this series that aren't in this space. Um, the other families are people I was introduced to through the project, uh, through the, the mixed race dialogues group that I mentioned earlier, they, you know, they had recommendations of people, um, uh, and actually one family that's not here, they're kind of like the really unique one, they read about my work in the paper, contacted me, and were like, can we be in the, wow. in, like, do you have space for us, and I was like, yes, I do, because um, they were actually the only um, couple that was alive and remembers the court case. Mm. So they like really wanted to be in the project. Um, that painting was in your public. That was in the public function. Yes, yeah. and they were at your talk. Yeah, sure. they were. Yeah, yeah. It was neat to meet them in person. <laughs> yeah, that was, was really cool. Great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to kind of talk about a few technical aspects of the work that's in the gallery space. I notice, um, looking around, looking at all these pieces, that there are um, you've incorporated the use of fabric. I've seen other pieces of yours where you've incorporated printmaking um, techniques, um, sewing, and um, I wonder if this aesthetic choice reflects kind of the nature of a piece together intersectional identity for you. Am I right in kind of? Yes. <laughs> yes. You're and like I'm, exactly I'm wondering, right. I'm wondering how you came about that technical choice of, of choosing to use alternative materials to paint upon. Right, right. Um, well, yeah, what you said is like definitely uh, part of it, for sure. I think also, um, I was just trying to figure out how to communicate a new language of complexity. And so I didn't want to just only use oil painting. And I know collage is a really good metaphor for that, like talking about like disparate materials coming together um, to create something whole and new. So you can look at that as like a metaphor for 
mixed race identity if you want to. Um, I think also really it's just, yeah, just trying to talk about like a new language. Like the reason um, I'm really kind of going for this kind of quilting feel mm -hmm. is because the quilt holds a lot of um, uh, symbolism as far as like family, the home, uh, domesticity, and especially like when it's up on the wall like that, it's kind of like a tapestry, and there's like this, you know, there's his, this history to that, um, and then mixing the oil paint with the quilting, like quilting has its own language, like it crosses cultures, you know, like it's, it's, um, very narr like totally narrative based, yeah. mm -hmm. and then so is oil painting. You know, oil painting is the exact same thing, just a different language, but like also has this very intense history, um, and uh, its own like people recognize symbolism and different things in oil painting as well. And so like merging both of these like very dense narrative languages together to create like its new it, its own new language is something I was really like hoping to achieve. Um, yeah, with it. I'm gonna kind of continue with the technical aspect too. Um, I one of the things that I love about your work in particular are these paintings that have um, they're a combination of these really labored, really detailed areas, and then these really lovely line drawings that sort of almost kind of end into nothingness, and um, they're so wonderfully executed. Um, and they work so beautifully. It's so, such a cohesive show, even though you've got some of these compositions, some of these compositions feel kind of different from one another. Can you tell us a little why um, you make you made that <coughs> some of these unfinished areas in these paintings? Yeah. Oh, before I do though, can I like ask what you think, or maybe what you think? Because yeah. I, well, you know, I don't really want to like say. You, you know, know, in like, particular, so, I'm yeah. struck by the piece. This piece right here. Um, when Nicole and I were drafting these questions, this is the painting that I was thinking about. Um, and really just sitting with it and wondering why intentionally um, is the hand over the face bleeding into um, the decorative pattern of the fabric and the background. Um, and does that, is this, you know, is her expression one uh, content? or wariness, you know, there's an ambiguity there. There's a closeness, but also maybe a sense of, of desire for separation or disconnect um, from, from being ogled, even. I don't know. Um, but I was thinking about this piece in particular when we were kind of framing that question. Uh, but certainly it occurs in almost a good number of the pieces in the space. For sure. Yeah, I like that. Um, I mean, it's different for every piece. You know, like, I do approach every sing each of these paintings individually. You can probably tell. Like, you know, there's there's threads, of course, um, as far as, like, techniques I'm using in each painting, and then they're all under this umbrella thematically. Um, but really, each piece stands alone. And so, like, I am approaching those spaces and those choices individually in each piece. Um, it doesn't mean the same thing in each piece, but I can say overall, I'm, there's a, f a few ways to look at it. Um, you know, it could be this like visual, um, this visual space for the viewer to kind of complete yeah. the narrative. Um, I'm a firm believer in uh, my paintings being not like a sentence with a period at the end, but kind of like I'm starting the sentence and the viewer is finishing it. Like I don't want to tell you the whole story. It's also not like I'm trying to like trick you or like, yeah. you know, I mean, there's definitely complex layers that like as you stare at one of my paintings, I hope, you know, you start thinking about more and more things and you're going down this rabbit hole. But I'm not, you know, at, at the end of the day, like the painting is a conversation between me and you. You know, it's not like me telling you what you're supposed to think. So um, the yeah, that space is supposed to be kind of this visual space mm -hmm. for the viewer. Um, you can also think of it as um, even like an unfinished story for the people that are being represented. Um, you know, uh, an idea of like fluidity, um, instability, not in a negative way, right? right. But like just right. instability. Um, uh, <coughs> also, um, yeah, just like 
their narratives are in flux. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really effective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't want them to feel super solid, right. like things right. are changing, especially when you're talking about like things like identity, you know, yeah. like that stuff's not, Absolutely. It's yeah. not, yeah. not But being able to address that on a technical level, right. it's just really great. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad, um, I'm glad it speaks that. We have been throwing around the word intersectionality for a little <laughs> bit now, and one of the questions that um, you know I think is really important to ask you is, what does that term mean for you <coughs> as an artist in your art practice? I don't want to assume that we all have the same definition, or we're all even necessarily familiar with that term, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so what does intersectionality mean for you in relationship to this? body of work and how you approach your own art practice. It's so hard. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, I think what it really means is, I mean, I think about intersectionality a lot, and it subconsciously is feeding into the work all the time. Um, I'll define it in a second for people who don't, don't know what it is. But, um, I think in the work, what it really represents, like how it manifests, is um, that the, the work, these people, um, they hold multiple truths. You know, like there's not just like a single story being represented. Uh, that these are like multi-layered individuals. <laughs> I think about it in terms of me trying to communicate that's something that's not black and white, um, that lives in um, a sort of gray area. Uh, and so that's how I feel like it kind of manif manifests itself in the work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to communicate uh, individuality with each of these people represented, but also a togetherness mm -hmm. um, and relationships and a family identity as well, which is complex and definitely I was always going back and forth with each of these paintings, like how do I really specifically want to represent these people because I want them to feel like they have their own complex stories within themselves as well as a unified story. So I think that also um, kind of plays into that in intersectional um, idea. But uh, intersectionality in general, the theory is that um, it's a theory of identity development, like or identity in general, where like you can hold uh, multiple advantages uh, and uh, disadvantages uh, at the same time. And so, like, we all have various aspects to our identities. Um, like, I can't be only black or only a woman. You know, like, they, they intersect. Um, and, and the reason why we have all of these different things is because we live, you know, under white supremacy. And so, like, the, the way that your different disadvantages intersect, and it's like you basically have this, like, puzzle piece of identity, right? And, like... Um, so the way I move through the world is complex. I'm not just moving through the world as a black woman. I'm not just moving through the world as a, like, a mixed race woman. I'm moving through the world as, you know, uh, heterosexual, you know, uh, American. You know, like there's all of these different levels of um, And it's simultaneous. Complexity. Yeah, and it's right. simultaneous. So yeah. you're, ex you're not experiencing I can't like experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't experience my blackness like separate from everything else. Mm -hmm. Like it's all tied in into one complex identity. Um, so that's, that's what it is, and like in the way I am trying to communicate complexity. So, um, yeah, I think that's how it's yeah, kind of like filters in. Um, I'm going to preface this next question a little bit, and I want to read the sort of the first section of your artist statement because I love it so much. Um, you write, "I'm fascinated by the politics of representation. Whose stories are represent represented in our imagery?" Who decides which stories are told? How are those stories told? And from whose perspective? So these are just brilliant questions that you've laid out for yourself as a you know, way to approach your work. And when I encounter your work and this particular body of work, I'm again struck by the intersectionality of the work, the fluidity um, of the um, interracial individuals and couples together mm -hmm. and I'm I'm wondering how you I think you've successfully done this but how do you move beyond a singular story of identity in your work um yeah I guess I kind of already talked a little about that but really just trying to 
communicate um, complex narratives. Um, historically, uh, I'm sure many of you guys have seen paintings of people before, um, but historically there hasn't really been a lot of representations um, by or of people of color historically in our Western canon of art that we're taught in school. Um, and so what my goal is is to like compli complicate those representations, like, you know, complicate blackness, complicate just like race in general because I think people really want the struggle of ambiguity. Um, and so I'm trying to, um, yeah, just communicate something complex about, about these people and these relationships um, beyond just like a, you know, one note or like something that's... And there's not one well. representation of a mixed race identity. No. Right? Yeah. Like, when you look around the room, there's very right. different types of <laughs> um, mm -hmm. couples, but also family relationships that are represented. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly, and I think, I mean, that's obviously something I'm trying to get at, too. Um, but, you know, to, to continue that, that idea, like, people of mixed race haven't been allowed to <laughs> to tell their own stories. You know, mm -hmm. I'm still using language. Even that term, mixed race, is so old school. It's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't even describe what mm -hmm. the, my lived experience. I don't even know, but like, I don't even know what term to use. Yeah, you we know. We yeah. talked a lot <laughs> I mean, about it's, vocabulary. It's, and it's voca like, vocabulary is crap, and so I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I didn't create those, those terms. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm supposed to just like live within this structure that's been like made for me um, and like what do you do when you live on the margins you know or in between lines and boxes and all of that stuff um, so yeah I, I think like just being able to tell like my experience or like you know my story it is just one mixed race experience I'm not trying to talk or speak for like everybody else that identifies as multiracial and there's absolutely no way you can because like in this world you know like that's, there's a lot of experiences right there's a lot of people that identify self-identify that way um so uh yeah i guess i'm just trying to you know come at it from from my personal experience but then also try to communicate something that is universal you know it i'm talking about race and identity but there's also uh other things like everybody can connect to topics of family community relationships, mm -hmm. um, intergenerational relationships, you know, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We probably have time for one more of our questions. Okay. And I, I think she's Let's already see. addressed this one. Let's I think we should do this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Although I have to say this really came from Anna when we were, because we both kind of brought a bunch of questions to the table and she brought this one and I said, yeah, I hope, I hope we get to this one. Um, so the question is, you've been creating artwork now that addresses the inv invisibility of mixed race perspectives for a while now. So you've been doing this, what, about almost two years now? I think almost, three years. Almost yeah. three years? Yeah. Okay. So um, has, your, has your art practice or the way you approach your artwork or kind of even what you're thinking about in terms of going towards the future, um, has it shifted any way since the election? Mm -hmm. the approach mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause it's, I, um, a lot of artists are processing this year, right? In a lot of different ways. And I know even in the Women's Art Institute, there were a lot of oh, yeah. questions coming up about how do we deal, how do we deal with what's happening as artists, right? Especially as women artists. And what does that mean for you? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Is this another long story? <laughs> no, no, no. no, it's actually, it's not long at all. It's not long at all. I'm, I'm just going to say no. It yeah. hasn't. It hasn't impacted my work in any way. Because I was making this work before Trump, mm -hmm. you know, um, this work was important before Good Trump. Work, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Trump, yeah, no, I don't. This work is way more personal than Trump. I don't really care about him. Um, like, you know, what he represents, white supremacy, sexism, racism, all that stuff was already around. Like, it's, <laughs> right. you know, we're just like, it's heightened, you know, because yeah. he's the president. But my work, was, I was already making this work before him, and I'm going to be making it after he's gone, which hopefully is Santa. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, I don't know. I mean, not, not, not to say that my work isn't, you know, that much more relevant or, um, or that, you know, people are um, more interested in the work maybe because of this, this point in time where we're at, but um, I think 
uh, what I'm talking about is, is really important. And like you just said, there's, there's, there's really a lack of representation um, just, you know, of these stories and just visual representation of these kinds of relationships in art. Um, if you were to walk into a museum, um, I doubt you're going to see a painting of two elderly women of different races, like, that comfortable next to each other. Like, that's just, like, you just don't typically don't see, see a family like relationship yeah. like that represented in, in our cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that it's, yeah, it's important regardless of who's in the right. office. Does the audience have any questions for Leslie? I'd just like you to, first of all, thank you for your candor and what you said is fantastic. Um, speak to the shapes of your paintings and mm -hmm. the use yes. of drawings um, <laughs> and size. Because they obviously, you're choosing that. And I'd just like to hear what you have to say. Um, yeah, so that's like three questions in one. Um, I'll go backwards. The size, no, it's okay. the size um, I don't know, I've always, I've always painted big. That's not really a good answer, though. I, I think I, I choose the size. It's almost life size. Well, some when my grandmothers are larger than life, but everyone else is like almost life size. I think it's a very approachable scale. Um, I think that it helps you, like, feel like these are real people um, in the space. So that's important to me. I have painted small before, totally different feeling. You know, like these people, you really have to like think about them as real people um, and bring yourself into their spaces. Um, so scale, yeah, is definitely important. Um, the grommets, I got the idea from my fav one of my favorite artists, Carrie James Marshall, who does that with his work. Um, I, I, I actually prefer to paint on panel, um, so all of the, the paintings that you see here that don't have grommets are on wood panel. Um, but I wanted to start experimenting with shapes and scale, and um, you can't get a panel that's five feet wide. Um, and tr plus, I then I need to rent a truck, and there's all these other like things. So I was like, oh, how do I get bigger? But like, actually, how am I able to do that with like my limited resources? And so rock canvas made the most sense. So then, yeah, I looked at like artists like Harry James Marshall, for example, who works so large that he can just roll up his painting and ship it somewhere, and it's like way cheaper than you know a two thousand dollar crate for a five foot painting. You know, so part of it is yeah, is that like I was thinking, how can I get big, but also um, make it feasible for myself and where I'm at in my career. Um, and then uh, ovals versus squares versus rectangles, I don't know, I, I kind of like allow the narrative I'm trying to tell dictate what <clears throat> the piece is going to look like. That informs the color, it informs the shape, it informs like everything, how much I want to uh, leave, you know, paint in and how much do I leave unresolved, like all of that stuff like is based on um, first and foremost like the people in the painting and like the relationship I'm trying to communicate. So, um, yeah, but I mean the, the ovals are also like, I mean there's like a tradition. Right, tradition yeah, that's, that's right? what I see. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, you're yeah. taking a contemporary totally. and mm -hmm. putting it back into history by yep. using that. Exactly, ovals. yeah, and that's, yeah, that's for sure an acknowledgement that I'm making with that too. Thank you. Yeah. Just related, um, you you visit um, your subjects in their spaces. Is yeah, that correct, right? And are you photographing them? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Working from your photographs that you take, so you both visit with them. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that comes through too in a, in its own way um, in each of those spaces, each of the compositions. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I actually do like working from life, like that's something I, I do enjoy, um, but not when you're working with families right. yeah, and kids, like that's just yeah. not possible, and also I don't want it to feel stiff like that, I'm not saying I couldn't like, sure. you know, push it in a way that would, it, but, but I just knew that like with the time constraint and like, yeah, yeah my resources that I had, like, it just made sense to photograph them, um, plus I wanted them to be in spaces where they felt comfortable, yeah. um, I actually asked each family um, where they wanted to be oh. mm -hmm. like you know they were a totally a, it was a collaborative process mm -hmm. like I didn't tell them where they had to be I didn't tell them what to wear um, 
they, you know, they chose all of that. Um, and then I just showed up, and I just took the photos with my iPhone. Um, especially with kids. I didn't want them to think this was, like, some profession yeah. thing that they had to perform for. You know, so, like, and they're very familiar with, like, taking a photo yeah. on the phone. So, like, you know, I was just, like, you know, just clicking away while I was having conversations with, with the, the people. Um, the only exception is the painting of my grandmother's. Um, that was actually, um, I have made a couple pieces of, of them uh, so far, and um, that one in particular, uh, I was just like scrolling through my photos one day like, on my computer, and I just like stopped on that photo. I was like, oh my gosh, they look so beautiful. Um, they're all fancy. Um, it's titled uh, Nigel's Wedding because it was at my cousin's wedding. Um, and uh, so that's that's where I took that photo. So that was totally by, like, I didn't like plan. Right, right. right. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering, I'm so attracted to your, the colors and the shades and tones of your work. <clears throat> and I wonder, as I look at the people, how much time do you spend on skin? I mean, do you gruel over that and go, oh, no, this isn't right, and it needs to be darker? And I, I mean, is that a conversation? Um, yeah, I don't know, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you brought up the skin because I do, um, yeah, I do really love making skin very colorful. Um, I mean, when we're talking about race, we're talking about skin color, right? Like, um, a lot of the time. Um, and so I really, yeah, I do focus on that a lot. But as far as, like, color choices or anything, um, I, I have to be honest with you, I've just been painting for a while now that, like, the color choices, it does kind of just happen intuitively. intuitively. Yeah, I'm not, like, thinking, like, oh, this, like, for sure needs a blue right here. Like, it just kind of mm -hmm. naturally happens as I'm painting. Um, but I am, like, have you seen one of my palettes before? Like, a picture of my palette? I don't think so. Um, I don't know, I, on social media, I yeah, post pictures yeah. of my palettes. <laughs> um, so, my palettes, like, I'll have, like, 50 colors minimum mixed out beforehand. So I'm not working, I rarely, I rarely work from a color straight out of the tube. Um, they're like secondary and tertiary colors are like all spread out on my palette pre-mixed. I'm an oil painter, so those colors will last for six to seven days if I wrap them really nice. So then I'll have like a good solid week session where I'm painting that painting with those colors. Um, so like all the colors are somewhat predetermined. I'll even mix those colors in with each other too. So by the end my palette looks totally messy. Um, but in the beginning it's very organized. So yeah, color is very important to me, but the process of like which colors to use is more intuitive. Like once I'm actually painting the picture. So you said you work from photographs. And obviously you, you know, you pick your subjects and whatnot. But you said you were snapping pictures as you're talking to people. What makes you choose each one? Is it a facial expression? Is it lighting? Is it like what draws you to each picture? You said you know that your grandmother's just looked beautiful for that one. Like kind of what draws you to your to the one you paint? That's such a good question. Um, and I'm just gonna let you know right now, like that process is so hard um, because I do snap so many pictures because I want it to feel natural. And sometimes I do pose them, right? Like some of the subjects you see here are like somewhat posed, but there were other instances during that photo shoot where they weren't posed. So like I am choosing whether I want them to feel like you know I'm taking the picture, right? Like I'm totally present in this composition even though I'm not in it, right? Um, and so trying to decide like what that is or like what image makes the most sense is really difficult and I, I'd say that was like four months of me just doing that like looking through photos and I'd like favorite you know I'd like like kind of like shrink them down like from 800 it would go down to 200 and then 50 and then 10 you know and then from there I just would like struggle really hard um, sometimes I actually make multiple paintings like I'll make smaller paintings of the ones that I don't choose for the larger piece but um also, there's like a component of like, 
how do I want to represent them? Like, these are people that aren't me, right? Like, there is, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of weight there. There's a lot of responsibility. There's, um, I want to honor them, but I also want to represent them authentically, but I, but I don't want to, like, idealize. There's all of these, like, layers when you're painting other people that is, um, yeah, so complicated. Um, and so, I don't really know how I, like, arrive to a specific image, but it does take a long time, and I'm thinking about all of those things, and I'm also thinking historically, like, how does this pose, what is this pose going to, like, bring up from paintings historically? Like, I'm thinking about all of these things. Um, when I'm choosing, like for example, this this painting, I don't know if you noticed, but this one's um, representative of uh, a one of the photographs from Life magazine mm. when uh, the Lovings actually had their like feature as the court case was going on. Um, this was yeah, uh, Mildred and Richard were almost in this exact same pose. Um, so that one's like the one that's kind of like reminiscent of. Of that, so it's like harkening back to that that imagery, but yeah, so I'm thinking about all of these different things. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard. It's hard, and sometimes I'm like, oh, did I pick the wrong one? But I know. <laughs> I'm already like three weeks in. I can't change it now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know you've talked about identity a lot, and of course you're painting um, portraits. Have you ever done self-portraits? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I've done a few. Um, I'm not a huge fan of painting myself, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I have done a few. I th I think, um, and I've mentioned this before in like other interviews. But I the paintings are already so much about me that I don't know if I really have to also put my face in them. <laughs> you know, because they're already coming from such a personal place, um, and. Uh, they're also, of course, very much about these people, but you know, it's come it's coming from that place of me wanting to see representations of families that look like mine. And and also let these kids, I want them to see representations of their families, right? Like it's not you know, so it's yeah, it's coming from that place, so I don't I don't think it really has to be me. Yeah. And they're representative of the relationships that you have with yeah. all of these. Well, right, yeah, even the people that I did just meet for, you know, for this project, like, you know, by the end of, like, a two-hour photo session, like, that's about race and identity, like, so you're, like, talking about some pretty intense things, like, right off the bat, like, you feel like you kind of know these people, you know, I don't know, so, yeah, it's about those relationships, too, for sure. Amy, did you have a question? I had a question, thank you. Um, in the process of making this work, did your understanding and maybe even definition of family change? What it means to be a family? Did it change? And if I could just, while you're thinking, just yeah. like something that occurred to me as I heard you talking, because you used that word a lot at the beginning, um, and, I, and I, like, I wanted to look up the definition of family, and in, in almost all the shades of definition, <coughs> children are included in that I notice that there are children in all of these pictures. And so I don't know, I just would like to hear you talk about, talk about that. Yeah, I don't know if my personal definition of family changed, um, but I was consciously trying to represent a multitude of like family experiences, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, just have like different types of families represented, um, different stages, you know, like so. Um, obviously a very young family, mm -hmm. also represented by the video game controller. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you got young kids, you got older kids. Um, yeah, I don't know, I just wanted to try to represent a diverse, you know, have a diverse representation of what family means. Mm -hmm. Um, because that, going back to that Cheerios commercial, like that was one thing I realized, I was like, Wow, these people don't think this is a family, mm -hmm. and so like their representation or their idea, their definition of family is so limited and small, you know. And I, I was like, mine's not as small as that, and like, how big can I really make it, you know, um, in this, in this series? So, gender and sexuality-wise too. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah. 
I mean, obviously not every type of family is represented here. I wish I could make a million paintings. <laughs> um, and there are five other paintings in this series too. But yeah, that was important to, important to me for sure. Uh, there was other one other painting that's not in this that I think would have really added to, to this conversation as well. Um, but it was sold, yay! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that that painting uh, it uh, talks about transracial adoption, which totally is within the conversation of mixed race identity, for sure. So, yeah, whole another level. So, as a mixed race person, also something that comes up for me um, when I think about how your work's being received is this transition from, like, not even transition from, but conversations that circulate a lot around just overt bigotry regarding being interracial to then tokenizing that coming off as complimentary. I'm sure you've heard this before. So, I'm just wondering about the reception of your art, too. Like, have there been a lot of microaggressions and tokenizing mm -hmm. things that people have said? Like, what has that been like? <laughs> <laughs> I like giggle because yes. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I've heard like every, you know, I've gotten everything, um, which was to be expected, right? Like, it's so funny because I look at these paintings and they feel actually quite tame to me. Um, but for some people, they're just so polarizing, and um, you can go on, you know, you can go on, like, the Huffington Post article that, that was written about this work and just read the comment section. It is very colorful. Um, I had to stop looking at it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting, and um, it's nothing I've, I haven't heard before. Um, but, like, I have to speak my truth, and, like, I want to see my, my lived experience represented, just like I'm sure all, like, all of these people in these paintings, like, really wanted to see, like, a family like theirs represented, you know, especially in, like, painting, like, on this traditional, like, space, you know, it's, um, where, where stories like this historically have not been told. Um, yeah, but yeah, microaggressions, people saying, you know, <laughs> this isn't important, you know, like, what's the point? Mm. Or that, um, why does she always talk about race? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, because, like, I've been racialized since I was zero. Like, you know, I don't know anything besides race. You know, like, that's literally all, all I've known. You know, like, as a kid, like, I was all, you know, just always having to confront the what are you question. Um, so I think in terms of that. And, um... Yeah, but like, yeah, also, there was one person who said something like, in, in that specific article, that uh, was like, this is race baiting. Um, mm. And, I don't know, just people that are unhappy about seeing these types of relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, again, that's to be expected. Uh, that's kind of why I'm, the work is important to make. Um, and I probably will continue making this work for some time. Uh, so, or, you know, work within um, this conversation for a while. Um, but people, at the same time, I've also had a lot of really positive expo uh, uh, responses as well, um, including some people who, um, who have said they've been moved to actually, like, they recognize their own biases, you know, and I was like, whoa, like, that's intense. And, and I think an artist, especially working with, you know, topics of like race and identity, like you hope that would happen, but like you don't, you don't know. Um, I don't ever know like who really is going to be my audience. Um, and there was one particular person who sent me, um, no, they wrote me a, a, a comment in my guest book. This was at the public functionary show. They wrote me a comment in my guest book, um, anonymous, so I don't know who it is, um, but I had to photograph it because it was so beautiful. This person um, said they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. A friend just told them to come to this show mm -hmm. called Loving, and they had no idea what to expect. They didn't know the topic. They are just like, oh, we're just going to go see some art. And they walked into the room, and they were, like, shocked because they weren't expecting to see interracial relationships. Like... Mm -hmm caringly paint, like painted or like in these mon monumental kind of like ways you know uh, um, and they said that they had to check themselves because they actually were like 
whoa, I don't know if I feel comfortable in this space kind of a thing. And that they didn't realize they had that bias until they walked into the room. Um, and that they made, and then the work made them think. And so I thought that was, um, that was really intense to read, but I thought that was really powerful too. So yeah, thank you for that question. <laughs> Yeah. One right back here. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of conversation about fluidity and how the work connects. But I know as an artist myself, there's always a, a certain way that you, the artist, connect to the work. Uh, and it's often like this spiritual connection that you feel within your own work because you are internalizing everything and basically putting all of that stuff on display. What I wanted to, what I would want to ask you is, what are you most proud of when you are done with the painting? Melinda, you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> um, what am I most proud of? I don't know. I mean, there's like a couple things I'm proud of, like artist to artist. Obviously, just being able to complete something is like really rewarding <laughs> because sometimes it just takes so long, and you're just second guessing yourself all the time. Um, so yeah, I I think there's that part of it, but but another part of it is just me being able to share this work. It's like, oh, man, if I could just. I kind of told you a little bit about my identity journey, like gave you a little brief snapshot, but four or five years ago, I don't think I would have actually had the courage to make work like this. Like I wasn't in a place where I could just like freely talk about like the complexity in my identity <laughs> and like, you know, like the, the um, microaggressions and all these things I felt growing up. Like that's stuff that you just don't like talk about with in a room full of strangers, you know? And I think, um, well, some of you guys aren't strangers. <laughs> but, um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think that I'm really proud of is like being able to see even my own journey like manifest in the work, you know, and that I can, um, yeah, where I'm at, like, yeah, comes through and like I can actually talk about these things and help maybe, um, maybe the work inspires that journey and other people or helps that along, you know. Um, this isn't the only thing I'm like doing in this realm. We didn't talk about it, but I, um, I also helped organize the first ever Midwest Mixed Conference, which happened this summer um, with, with other uh, activists, organizers, artists, um, and anybody could attend. Anybody who's just interested in talking about race and identity, you know, um, and that was extremely powerful because we had so many people there. Wait, and it was Midwest, so I'm talking like, it happened here in St. Paul, but we had people from Chicago, we had people from Kansas, like, that came, drove up here to, like, talk about their personal identity journey at this conference. Um, we didn't know what to expect. It got almost 150 people there. And uh, you had people all over the spectrum. Like, some people are, like, super woke, like, know, know everything about their identity, just, like, want to talk about it. And then you had people, like, people who are 40, never, you know, confronted, like, the trauma that they went through as a kid and like trying to like you know understand their identity so it's crazy so like I hope that this art can kind of be you know I don't know helpful in that way too it was at the conference too but yeah does that kind of answer your question? For sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I saw the uh, Carrie James Marshall retrospective yes. in New York. Did you see yeah. it? Yes, I did. Well, I saw it in Chicago. Okay. Yeah, so good. Oh my God. So good. What? And I'm wondering if you're in in uh, conversation with him at all about. Well, you could be. You could be. Uh, about what he does. I mean, he he used. I read his uh, explication, and he uses seven different shades of black to paint his figures, and they're monumental, and they're like. So vivid, and I, I can just imagine the kind of pushback he's gotten around his work for saying, you know, these people are black, and you know, there's no getting around what you are looking at, and they are they're just so beautiful, and did that he used seven different shades of black. I was just like so struck by that. I could only come up with like four or five. <laughs> so anyway, I just wonder if you're if you've thought about contacting him and sharing your work with him and, and having some sort of, you know, 
Meeting of the minds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's uh contacting him? I <laughs> I I uh I don't know, I guess I I'm a little nervous, but can I it's funny that you asked that question because I just got a text from uh a friend of mine, a mentor, um, who's also an artist. She was she lived here for a while, Caroline Kent. I don't know if you guys know her, she's an abstract painter, but now she lives in Chicago. Um where Carrie James Marshall lives. Uh -huh. She texted me a photo literally like three weeks ago in Carrie James Marshall's kitchen. <laughs> when she was like hanging out with Carrie James Marshall, because she knows I love him, yeah. and with her husband and with his wife, and they're just like having dinner. Well, there you go. And yeah. so yeah. I think I might have a little. Yeah, uh, yeah I gotta, I gotta book that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So hopefully, someday soon that'll happen. I think that's a good place to end it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Leslie, so much. For thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again for yes. coming. Yeah, the show is up through December 15th, so keep coming back and looking at the piece. Yes, definitely. Thank you.